Thank you for joining today. It's really exciting. Uh, we're starting today our focal plane features, um, which is our new microscopy webinar series. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I want to take just a couple of minutes to tell us um, to tell you about us. Um, so um, we're focal plane, uh, the microscopy community site hosted by the Journal of Cell Science, and I'm Esperanza, the community manager of focal plane. Um, we created Focal Plane for you to connect with like-minded people and also find resources and information regarding um, relating to microscopy. Um, and in our site, you can find, for example, news, interviews, blog series, uh, posts uh, discussing new tools or protocols, um, job listings, and also a calendar with events. Um, our community site is free to access. And you just need to create an account in order to start posting your own contributions. Um, so please come, um, have a look if you didn't know about us, and join our community. Um, let me, uh, going back to today's event, um, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, um, Jennifer Lipping cortis -Parts. Um She is a group leader at the HHMI Janilia Research Campus in Ashburn, uh, Virginia. Um, Probably there are a lot of researchers that, de um, de that do not define themselves as cell biologists nowadays. Um, the, field of cell bio the, uh, the field of cell biology has expanded into multiple and diverse fields. Um, but I think we can say that Jennifer is a true cell biologist uh, who has been showing us throughout her career um, that organelles and cytoskeleton are not static entities inside the cells, but that in fact they are highly dynamic and interact with each other. And we'll probably see some of this today. Um, I won't go in detail um, through all her research, but if you want to learn um, where the microscopy field has um, moved in the last decades, uh, just have a look at, their, at her publications. Um, from the use of monoclonal antibodies uh, to performing live cell imaging um, with video recording, uh, using GFP for live cell, um, implementing FRAP, developing photoactivable GFP, um, to palm and other super resolution techniques. Um, everything you're gonna find it through her publications. Um, when we started um, planning um, this seminar series, um, we wanted to invite speakers who have been making great contributions to the field of microscopy, either technology development, cell biology, or bioimage analysis. Um, but not only that, taking also advantage of the remote platform that we're using today, um, we also wanted to give the opportunity for early career researchers uh, to meet the speakers. Um, and Jennifer is one of these scientists who, despite being super busy, uh, she's still always approachable. Um, she is well known for her willingness to speak with the students at meetings and conferences. And we are delighted that she also agreed to join our um, scientific advisory board of uh, Focal Plane. Um, so we couldn't ask for a better speaker. Um, to start our opening, um, opening our new webinar series. Uh, so thank you, Jennifer, for accepting the invitation. Um, and just before I pass the screen to Jennifer, um, I just want to remind you about the networking event um, and the meet the speaker session that we'll have after the webinar. So after the Q&A, we'll move to the remote conference room and you'll find um, that you'll be seated at a table. So here you can see an overview of that room. Um, so just remember that if there are different floors, which you can see here on the uh, on the left side um, on the of the window. Um, if you don't see anyone, you're probably in a different floor. Um, so you're not in the first floor where the main uh, tables are set. Um, so just click on the floor and then just change um, to the other one. Um, as I said, the meet the speaker table as well as the focal plane and the meet the journal uh, of cell science editor tables are gonna be located on the first floor. Um, so please stay after and meet with us there. Um, we'll send you more instructions through the, through the chat later. Um, but for now, I'm just gonna stop sharing. And um, let Jennifer start sharing her screen. So thank you, Jennifer. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. And uh, can you see my slides? No, it's fine. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much, Esperanza. And uh, I also want to shout out for Focal Plane. I think what they're doing with these webinars, but also the, the whole um, palette of um, uh, possibilities for different, micros 
different microscopy techniques to be shared on this online fashion, fashion is really going to be very powerful. And so looking forward to reading some of the things that people put up on it. So today I'm going to be talking about um, some cell biology, in particular um, imaging technologies that are now allowing us to um, continue our search for understanding how cells are organized. Um, in particular, I'm going to be sharing with you some new technologies uh, where we're using single molecule dynamics to interrogate particular organelles like the endoplasmic reticulum, as well as whole cell organelle reconstructions throughout um, an entire cell using electron microscopy. Um, so why are we interested in doing this? Um, because eukaryotic cells are extremely complex organized systems. Uh, every eukaryotic cell on Earth um, is comprised of at least nine similarly subcompartmentalized organelles that include uh, the ER, which, uh, which creates the nucleus by uh, generating a nuclear envelope, um, the Golgi apparatus, uh, which is involved in secretory flux um, out of the endoplasmic reticulum, which is where proteins are being synthesized and lipid, um, to lysosomes and endosomes, uh, as well as um, well, the endosomes and lysosomes are very much a part um, of the enabling capacity of eukaryotes to be able to take up material from their surroundings, which really distinguishes them uh, quite a bit from bacteria and archaea. Um, the eukaryotes also have energy producing and metabolizing organelles that include um, mitochondria, peroxisomes, um, uh, autophagosomes can digest whole organelles as well as break down um, uh, proto, uh, complex materials uh, that the cell wants to recycle. All of these organelles um, are critical for the way a eukaryotic cell functions and are found uh, from, I mean, in every, as I mentioned, every other or, um, eukaryote on Earth. So if you look at the Toxoplasma gondii uh, cross-section to the upper left, um, and you sort of zoom in on the interior compartments of this organ of this cell, you can see that it's pretty much identical um, in terms of being comprised of all of these different organelles, all bite at a much smaller scale. So if we're going to really understand how eukaryotic cells function, we need to understand how these organelles are interacting with each other, are conveying material between each other, and that's been really the challenge of cell biology over the last 50 years. The approaches um, for looking at this, uh, this, this interior compartmentalization of uh, cells uh, have been numerous. We have biochemical approaches, molecular genetic approaches. What I'm gonna be talking about are imaging approaches uh, that have really um, allowed us to not only more fully define the fine architecture of all of these intracellular compartments uh, through the use of electron microscopy approaches, but also to look at the dynamism and the protein specificity inside these cells using um, uh, GFP-based uh, imaging technologies. So I want to start by uh, focusing in on some new technology related to electron microscopy. And then I'm gonna to move to some um, approaches for light mi that are being now used in light microscopy for interrogating organelle structure and dynamics. Many people ask me, well, which is better to use in terms of addressing cell biological questions? And my answer is, it completely depends on the particular question that you're answer, that you're um, probing and um, both technologies really are necessary if you're going to get a full picture of the way cells are working. But I want to now start with um, electron microscopy and uh, what are the new approaches that are sort of on the, on the horizon for really taking us to the next level um, in EM. 
And one of these techniques is called focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy uh, that's being used um, at Genelia um, thanks to some spectacular uh, engineering developments by Harold Hess in a way where we essentially do uh, embed a specimen within a, a block. Um, and then you do scanning electron microscopy on a, on a face of that block. Um, and you use a focused ion beam to mill very thin sections uh, uh, through that block. And every milling cycle is met with a uh, scanning EM cycle. So basically, you're taking pictures at very thin layers across um, the entire uh, block. What that allows uh, for the first time is isotropic resolution of large volumes of cellular material. And what you're looking at here is a, is a tissue that's been fibsimmed um, through the entire block. Uh, but it's also possible to fibsim at very fine uh, uh, milling uh, depths to get isotropic resolution through an entire cell. And so that's what you're looking at here. This is a HeLa cell um, where uh, we're milling at uh, four nanometer slices. And the XY resolution with sim, the SIM approach is four nanometers. So we have isotropic um, resolution, uh, basically. So we can see the three-dimensional relationship of all of these different organelles. Now, as you can imagine, this is a huge amount of data um, to even contemplate trying to understand. Uh, that's one of the things that we've been working on at Genelia. Um, this is just one cubic micron block in the center of that HeLa cell. You can see the centrosomes uh, right here, the centrioles here. But what we've done in this block is to segment out all of the different organelles that we can recognize, shown to the left, uh, through the continuous slices, slices through this cubic micron block. And that's what you're looking at here. You can see the microtubules. This is uh, a Golgi stack. You can see the endoplasmic reticulum in green. All of these organelles you can see are just very tightly associated uh, with each other. Now that block of a uh, cubic uh, micron block took one person seven to 10 days to uh, essentially manually segment each slice that comprised this block. So if we were gonna do a whole cell, for instance, that whole HeLa cell, uh, which is 7,000 cubic microns in volume, we estimate it would take us a single person 50 years, which is just not tenable. And so that raises the question of whether we can use other approaches to be able to get access um, to this kind of exquisite um, information related to the compartmental organization of these uh, organelles uh, in a shorter time frame. And for that, we've um, at Genelia, we've set up a project team called Cell Organelle Segmentation in EM, or COSEM, where we're combining the EM data acquisition that is being acquired through the FIBSIM um, uh, technology uh, with mach machine learning approaches to try to reach a level where we can access all the information in these cells that are being FIBSIM through to get new biology. So here's uh, an example of the pipeline that we're currently using to achieve this. Uh, you can see there's many people that are participating in this effort, but basically we start with first acquiring the data set, whether it be a four nanometer milling, cy uh, milling cycles or eight nanometer milling cycle. Uh, we start with data pre-processing, which is basically just aligning all of the different slices. And then the hard task of manual annotation of select subsets of the small little volumes of this cell that can then be, that can be manually annotated to identify different organelles. And that is then handed over to computer, uh, computer scientists uh, who use that as training data for developing a machine learning um, 
set of algorithms that will then automatically segment when the computer is given the rest of the cell. Once that's done, uh, the information goes back to the humans who evaluate the quality of the machine learning uh, callouts. Um, once that's been accomplished, uh, we move to data post-processing uh, and uh, the development of tools that allow us to do data analysis. And then ultimately, um, the data is put up for sharing. And the data that I'm going to be talking about today is, is already up on the internet. Um, you can just, you can go to it. Uh, you can see it in the Genelia uh, website. Um, uh, and uh, basically, you have access to all of the information that I'm going to be talking about today. So here's just an example of uh, this pipeline. Here's a cell that was FIT-SIMMED. Um, we're going to now select um, a, a bunch of different areas of this cell, shown in these little cubic boxes, that our, annual, our annotators are going to then come in and manually annotate um, the different organelles. And so here you can see um, they, will, they can call out based on well-known characteristics of different types of um, membrane organization, whether something's a Golgi, a mitochondria, an endosome, um, a nuclear envelope, centrosome, et cetera. Now, once that's done, um, these annotated data sets are handed over to the computer scientists who then look at, uh, develop um, algorithms that can look for repeating signatures throughout the rest of the cell to be able to segment all of the organelles um, that we have manually annotated through the rest of the cell. And um, basically for these cells that I'm talking about today, we have uh, close to 30 different structures uh, that we've um, been able to identify in this way. And this is just one particular cell where you can see all the predictions that were um, automatically uh, segmented. Now we've done this for <clears throat> Uh, four different cells, two, two HeLa cells, a macrophage, and a jerket cell. This data, as I say, is up on the internet now. So if any of you are interested in trying to come in and uh, query different parts of these cells, please feel free. It's an enormous amount of um, material that uh, a single lab or a single institute really can't uh, get their head wrapped around, basically. Uh, this requires uh, almost a worldwide effort of people to just dig into this data in any way that they, they want. So here's an example. Um, I'm just pulling out the Golgi apparatus from the HeLa cell. Um, <clears throat> most of you think about uh, the Golgi apparatus as a, just a single stack of pancakes uh, with little vesicles around them. Um, when you, when you segment out the entire Golgi apparatus in a HeLa cell, you can see it's in an enormously complex uh, system of, yes, stacked cisternae, but those cisternae are elaborately interconnected with each other through tubules. Um, and as you can see in, in red, there are lots of small little vesicles surrounding um, uh, these interconnected uh, stacks of cisternae. We can also come in and uh, pull out information related to uh, the rel relative cell volume of different structures within cells to get a, a sense, just an admittedly a very simplified sense of the overall distribution of these different organelles in these different cell types. So you can see, um, for instance, the jerket cell has an enormous uh, nucleus compared to uh, some of these other cells. Uh, you can see that in the case of the macrophage, it has a much larger uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Um, these types of analyses are very easy to carry out uh, with this data set. Uh, what we're looking towards is the ability in the future to be able to compare, to do this type of analysis in tissues where um, you can look at different cell populations comprising the tissue and potentially get insight into what individual cells might be doing based on 
the relative distribution of these different organelles. But we can get some very interesting biology from this system. Um, here we're going to zoom in on this uh, HeLa cell here and uh, look at just some of the examples of the things that you can do. Here's a, here's a microtubule. And basically, color-coded along the surface of that mi microtubule are contact sites um, that the microtubule has with five different structures, including ER, Golgi, nucleus, endosome, and uh, vesicles. So a single microtubule is connected to many different uh, organelles uh, for trafficking. This is um, segmentation of the endoplasmic reticulum towards the interior of the cell. Uh, we've color-coded different parts of that endoplasmic reticulum, whether it's um, uh, planar sheet-like areas, which are almost always in close contact with mitochondria, which are, which are shown in orange. Uh, we also have um, an enormous amount of ER that uh, is this sort of tubular array, and I'll talk more about that later. But basically, with these data sets, you can begin to define very precisely um, different morphologies of different organelles and where these organelles are contacting other organelles. So we're, I think, at the tip of the iceberg with the possibilities that are um, out there for uh, this, this serial focused ion beam scanning EM approach. Um, it's not just, you, you can not only cut through um, individual cells to get insight into subcellular organization, organization, but you can also cut through an entire tissue. Um, and for an embryo, you could probably cut through, easily cut through an entire em embryo as well uh, to stitch together um, the interactions between the different cells. But importantly, in the case of cell biology, uh, looking at how organelles are arranged in this um, uh, within a within cells within a tissue, so it's it's a totally exciting time right now uh, to be a cell biologist uh, because we now have the opportunity to really interrogate these subcellular structures in many different um, environments. Now I want to now turn to this other approach that has. Uh, been used by cell biologists to probe organelle structure, but in particular to probe organelle dynamics, which EM can't do. And so that's why light microscopy is so important. It allows you to interrogate dynamics, but also in a global context, because you can, you can, you can view things at large, so uh, to, to a certain extent. Um, and you also, importantly, have protein specificity, because in many of the cases, since the revolution of uh, GFP, um, we have the ability to tag virtually any protein in the cell with a fluorescent probe and get protein specificity as you introduce it into the cell. So let's get into this. And in particular, I want to focus in on the endoplasmic reticulum. I'm going to share with you some work that we've been doing um, in related to the endoplasmic reticulum, in particular, three structures um, that um, enable the ER to really perform its complex roles. So the first structure I want to talk about are ER contact sites, which are structures that uh, where the ER makes contact with other organelles. We know from many much research in the, in the, in the field, that the ER contacts every single other organelle within the cell, and at those contact sites are important transfer events occurring. Lipid is transferring at those contact sites, calcium gets transferred, and other small metabolites. So it's a way for the ER to communicate itself, to sense the cell, everything going on in these other organelles in the cell, and also feedback to those organelles. I'm also gonna talk about ER matrices, which is a specialized organizational form of the ER, which turns out to be pretty interesting. And finally, I'm going to be talking about ER exit sites, which are the sites that newly synthesized proteins, secretory proteins, um, concentrate at in order to leave the ER and move through the secretory pathway. So 
let's look at this stuff. Let's start with your ex, uh, your contact sites. So here's a lattice, a three D lattice light sheet, time lapse movie, showing mitochondria um, segmented out to the left in red, where you're seeing the entire mitochondrial pool within the whole cell. Um, to the right are all of the portions, this, all the all the surface of the mitochondria, where the endoplasmic reticulum, highlighted in green, is making contact. So I show this movie because I think it really underscores the communication between these two organelles. Much of the surface of the ER, of the mitochondria, and this is a normal, you know, a well-fed cell. Much of that surface of that mitochondria is um, being communicated with uh, through contacts with the ER. Now, when I say contact, I don't talk about. There's no fusion. Happening. Uh, between mitochondria and ER. There are tethering molecules that hold these uh, or organelles in close opposition so that you can get transfer events. So two postdocs in the lab, Chris Abera and Johnny Nixon Abel, Johnny is now in Cambridge, uh, Chris is still in the lab, uh, have been pushing uh, a new strategy for trying to understand these uh, ER contact sites. And that's using single molecule tracking of proteins in the ER. What you're looking at here are tracks in green of a halo tagged KDEL protein uh, that is in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. You can see it is moving around freely throughout the entire ER, which is labeled in MM mold with a ER resident uh, component. So we can, we have a, we've in order for you to be able to see the ER, we, we have a separate ER marker, um, and we're now superimposing the trajectories of this KDEL protein on that. Uh, and you can see that this KDEL protein is freely moving and movies real time, so you're actually seeing how fast these molecules diffuse. So the question was, what if we tag not KDEL, but a protein like that B? that is a tethering protein that enables the ER to make contact with another organelle and track its trajectories. What would we see? So here are trajectories um, of this protein called VAP-B, which is an ER contact site protein. In particular, it makes important contacts with, for instance, the mitochondria. So we put a halo tag um, onto VAP-B and I should emphasize that in order to be able to track proteins in the way that I've been showing, you need something brighter than just a fluorescent protein attached to your molecule. Um, in our case, we're using a halo tag uh, that is then recognized by a very bright photoactivatable dye. And that's how you're able to um, uh, highlight individual molecules and track them over significant uh, trajectories, significant uh, time periods. So here is a zoomed up region of the trajectories of this uh, VAP-B. And here's a single trajectory to help you sort of understand what this molecule is doing. What I think you can see is that the molecule seems to be freely diffusing in the ER. And then suddenly it moves into a region where it sort of is trapped. It's moving around in this region but it's not coming out of that region very quickly. That was exciting because it suggested maybe this is a hotspot for an ER organelle contact site. So how do we test that? Well, we take our uh, um, ER probe and we also introduce a mitochondrial probe because uh, one of the major contact sites, is, as I showed you, that the ER makes with other organelles is with the mitochondria. So in red is the mitochondria that we've also introduced into the cell. And the trajectories that you're seeing that are color-coded based on speed uh, are that B. That B makes, uh, is a tethering molecule that reaches off the surface of the ER and can interact with other proteins on other organelles to tether them. And in the case of mitochondria, it's PTP P5 that it's interacting with. So um, 
when we did this, we found that the hotspots, yes, are at sites where the ER are very closely associated with mitochondria. Occasionally, we see hotspots that aren't next to the mitochondria, and we think those are potentially other uh, other organelles that the ER is making contact sites. But we're going to focus in on these ER mitochondrial contacts. So um, this is a, uh, a different type of representation of these contact sites. Basically, if you look to the right, uh, we just normalized the localization probability of single VAPI molecules. And this is because we're doing this at a single molecule level and we're fitting the centroids of our, of our individual molecules, this is super resolution. This single molecule, super resolution live cells. And you can see that VAPI has hotspots for localization all along the surface of the mitochondria, which is highlighted in this um, accompanying image in red. The yellow represents the area that the mitochondria sort of moved around in over the course of the 60 seconds that we were performing this single molecule tracking experiment. But what you can see, we think, is all of the sites along the surface of that mitochondria where uh, these contact sites are. It's pretty, pretty cool. So how does that fit with the type of images of contact sites that we saw in our FibSim images? So to the left is a FibSim reconstruction of an ER mitochondrial contact site. Um, in red is the contact zone uh, where we can, we can definitively define it because of how close these two organelles are with each other. And this is uh, this um, image to the upper right is just sort of allowing you to look on fonts at this contact site. Now, if we look at the overall dimensions of these contact sites and compare them to the dimensions of the contact sites that we see by our single particle tracking, we see there's very close similarity. Um, and this is just some other examples of this. Um, this is uh, the localization probability map. Here are the individual trajectories uh, of uh, this exact um, time sequence. Now, importantly, not only can we get information from this kind of data, using single molecule tracking approaches on terms of the overall size and shape of these contact sites. But we can get information on how the molecules that move into these sites are behaving. And so here is, uh, in this upper right panel, our diffusion is the effective diffusion coefficient of individual that being molecules that are moving in or into and out of this contact site. Uh, and this is just showing, uh, as if you draw a line through this, uh, how these molecules, as they move into the site, they're gradually showing slower and slower behavior. Um, the slowest behavior is in the center of this site, and then they, they, um, the diffusion coefficient shifts back at, towards the edge of it. This kind of information we are now using to try to interrogate different types of models for how that be is interacting with its partner on this on the mitochondrial uh, membrane. Uh, we're very interested in trying to understand um, the dynamism of that, uh, you know, what type of adhesion interaction might be going on. We think we can get that information by looking at these um, curves in more detail. But something else we can do that's pretty cool is we can look at what happens to these contact sites when we perturb cells in different ways. It's already known in the field that these contact sites are impacted by nutrient state of the cell. And so, um, but how, you know, people haven't really been able to look at because people haven't been able to look at these contact sites. Here we've starved cells with HBSS for eight hours. And what we can see is a very big difference in terms of um, the size and shape of these contact sites between mitochondria and ER. And we can also see a change in the effective diffusion coefficient of the VAP B as it moves into and out of the site. So here's uh, under starvation, you can see it becomes much more tightly associated, uh, the, the ER and um, the VAP B with the, uh, the 
contact site uh, compared to in just regular medium. Now, we've just been looking at uh, VAP-B and its tethering uh, interactions with mitochondria, but we know that there's several other contact site proteins that link the ER and mitochondria together and play important roles in how these two organelles communicate with each other. And so we're hoping that this technology can be used to begin to interrogate these other types of interactions and more significantly, uh, give us a picture of how all of these different tethering components are actually organized at a single contact site. Okay, I now wanna move on to this second topic called ER matrices, which probably many of you are probably scratching your head and saying, what the heck? You know, <laughs> ER matrices, what, what are they? Okay, well, um, these are structures um, in the ER. So what you're looking at here is a, is a 3D structural illumination image of the ER in a COS7 cell. And if we start zooming into the periphery of the cell, you can see these little areas that I'm pointing out here uh, that look almost like sheets in the periphery. What we found is that they aren't sheets. Um, they're actually uh, very tightly arrayed three-way junctions of ER. Um, so the endoplasmic reticulum uh, is a single compartment. We know that from diffusional mobility studies. Every single part of the ER is connected um, to the rest of the ER, and proteins can diffuse through this whole system. Part of uh, the ER is made up of tubes, and these tubes connect with each other via what are called three-way junctions. When those three-way junctions coalesce into very tight arrays, we call those arrays matrices. And we're able to see these for the first time because of a new technology that allows you to not only get structural illumination, um, two-fold increase in, over diffraction-limited imaging, but we can do it very, very fast using this grazing incidence turf uh, imaging, where we're just imaging very fast at a single plane. So let's look at these uh, matrices and look at what they might be doing. Um, so in order to do that, Andy Moore in the lab decided the first question is, how do they form? Is there any kind of cytoskeletal system that might be um, important for the way these structures of ER form? And so the first possibility was microtubules. Um, another possibility were intermediate filaments. Um, here's the metin. So in order to distinguish between these two, um, it's pretty hard if you just look at the overlap at this level. What Andy did was he basically did a ER radial distribution analysis where he basically is taking the ER and putting it in one plane. And then he's looking at, in that plane, if you look at the radial position, um, what's the rescaled intensity of ER microtubules in the mentin? And what he saw uh, was that despite the fact that my, we know that microtubule ER can be pulled out on microtubules, so no question ER contacts microtubules and get pulled out to the periphery of the cell, by and large, the ER overall pattern does not match that of microtubules. It matches much more robustly the distribution of a metin in the cell. So that led us to start exploring the possibility that maybe met, the metin uh, is sort of contacting the ER and doing something with the ER. And this is where things got interesting. If we start, if we introduce a bimetin probe into the cell that we're also looking at ER with, you can see that the areas where the matrices are localized seem to be co-localizing with the metin hotspots or knots. Uh, so bimetin is a as a cytoskeletal component that can form um, uh, filaments, those filaments can sort of be drawn together into these knot-like structures. And it seems as if 
the ER is following suit. So here's the Menton. This is a time-lapse movie that I think I'm hoping will convince you of this. The, the Menton is in white, in red is the ER. And what you can see is the Vimentin seems to plaster itself on the surface of the ER. And as the Vimentin coalesces into these knots, it pulls the ER into, the, um, into these tight matrices at the same time. This was like really bizarre when we first looked at it um, and started scratching our head. Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, so here's just another example of this. Um, the Metin uh, knots to the right. Here's KDEL. You can see the matrix um, region of the ER, and they are beautifully aligned, um, suggesting a very important uh, uh, role of the Metin in color, uh, bringing uh, the ER together in this way. And so here we have um, an example of um, the Metin knots. They are um, one of the things that the Metin does in the cell is it's pulling uh, the intermediate filament system towards the nucleus. Um, many intermediate filaments actually link the nucleus to the periphery of the cell. Um, so we think that this is uh, one way that the cell might be able to sort of pull, retract in of uh, endoplasma reticulum. And uh, consistent with that, if we trace uh, the trajectories of these matrices, we see that the matrices actually get pulled towards the center of the cell along with the intermediate filaments. Um, I don't have time to tell you about what are the molecules that are linking the metin to the ER, uh, but uh, basically we think that um, uh, there is some very um, intimate interactions between these structures. So here's the metin knot that is being formed um, as the cell in the cell periphery and ultimately uh, presumably in conjunction with an actin arc or retrograde flow is going to pull its uh, sort of pull, um, retract um, material back towards the nucleus and we think it's dragging the ER matrices along with it. But the more important question that I that in the interest of time that I want to get at is what are these ER matrices doing? Why do we want to even think about them um, other than their sort of interesting looking structures? Well, one of the reasons why we were very interested in these matrices is in our FibSim data sets, when we looked at ER localized ribosomes, which you're seeing here, um, we found that the ribosomes visualized as these punctate uh, green structures are in many cases highly concentrated at these ER matrices. Um, and furthermore, if you zoom up on one of these areas, you can see that the pattern of these ribosomes is such that they are actually engaging in translation. These are polysome arrays, um, uh, which you know, have a uh, basically a series of ribosomes on a single mRNA. So here's, here's your ER, uh, here's the matrix, and this is where it uh, looks like protein translation is occurring on the surface of the ER. So that suggests the matrices might play some role in regulating protein translation on the surface of the ER. And so that was something Heejin Choi, a postdoc in the lab, got super excited about. So we decided to start visualizing mRNAs uh, that are translating proteins that move into the ER. Uh, and so here we're looking at uh, a cytochrome P450 molecule that on the one hand has an MS2 tag, so we can track the mRNA. And that's what you're seeing here in yellow. These are the trajectories of this cytochrome P450 mRNA. Um, and the Pink is the overall um, signature of that mRNA at diffraction limited imaging. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, the mRNA trajectory, yeah, exactly. The mRNA trajectory is yellow, purple is the mRNA itself at diffraction limited. And in green is the protein, the cytochrome P450 protein 
that is being synthesized from that mRNA, uh, which we can visualize because we sun tagged that cytochrome 4, 450. Uh, sun tag is a, an approach developed um, uh, by Jonathan Friedman and other people, uh, Ron Bale's group, uh, where they can uh, a, a, a fluorescent probe in the in the cytoplasm can link to uh, the newly synthesized protein as it comes out of the ribosome. And so, uh, in green is this newly synthesized cytochrome 450. Here's the mRNA, um, and we can see it in the cells. So where is it uh, being synthesized? Uh, in order to look at that, uh, we uh, basically just put this. We looked at this in live cells where we have an ER background, and you can see that the proteins are being synthesized preferentially at these three-way junctions. Um, and in this, in this particular case, we're looking at a different uh, membrane protein uh, that's co-translationally inserted into the ER, and that's silotransferase, which is a Golgi enzyme. So what you're looking at is the mRNA coding for this protein, and you can see uh, that when it's translating, um, it is at these three-way junctions and relatively immobile. Now, what's interesting is that if we look at other organelles besides the ER um, and their relationship to these translating mRNAs that are coding for uh, proteins that enter the secretory pathway or proteins that uh, make up the ER, we see that often um, they are right near lysosomes. Um, so lysosomes seem to be pretty close to where these proteins are being synthesized. And one way of sort of reconciling that is uh, sort of illustrated in this movie taken by Don Lee several years ago, where um, we've done GI turfs and imaging, looking at the lysosome in relationship to the ER. Um, the lysosome is in green, ER is in purple, and you can see that frequently the lysosome gets trapped in the three-way junctional regions of the ER. Um, the, the lysosomes are zipping along microtubules normally, but they are adhering. There, there's a very close affinity of lysosomes with ER, and frequently you see the lysosomes get trapped in these three-way matrices. So that started us thinking that lysosomes may actually be impacting the translation of these proteins at the ER junctions matrices, potentially by releasing important material that could facilitate translation. So for instance, um, we know lysosomes degrade molecules and the degradation products, amino acids, get secreted. Um, if you're right next to a lysosome, you're gonna get a better ability to grab onto those amino acids, which is what a translating mRNA might want to do. And so we looked at uh, the translation efficiency of our mRNA proteins under a series of different conditions. Uh, and what we found was, of course, we knock out the ability to translate with pyromycin. But if we introduce a protease cocktail to inhibit uh, uh, proteolytic digestion within the lysosome, so we don't get release of amino acids, uh, we also get a drop in the uh, uh, mobility, uh, the ability of these uh, proteins, these mRNAs, to translate uh, their protein. And we see a slight effect of altering the pH of the lysosome. Interestingly, we're not seeing any effect of um, inhibiting mTOR, um, which we had thought might be playing a role uh, in regulating um, the translation from the lysosome. So to sum up this ER matrix data, I hope I've convinced you that this particular form of the ER is a quite interesting structure. Um, we think that these um, matrices are interacting with the metin, and that's how they are being formed and potentially being pulled back towards the center of the cell. As they get, as they move back towards the center of the cell, we think uh, they can trap organelles like lysosomes, and they can also more efficiently serve as sites for mRNA translation 
of membrane and luminal proteins that comprise the endoplasmic reticulum and the secretory pathway. Okay, in the remaining five minutes or so, um, I want to talk about ER exit sites. Um, so ER exit sites are structures that um, allow the endoplasmic reticulum to release newly synthesized molecules into the secretory pathway. And as you can see from this movie here, um, I'm going to show it in a second, uh, the ER exit sites are scattered all along uh, the peripheral ER, as well as more in the center of the cell. And uh, material that enters these ER exit sites then uh, is conveyed towards the Golgi apparatus, shown here in the center of the cell, along microtubial tracks. We've known this for many, many years. But what we haven't really had good insight into is the three-dimensional organization of this system. How do, what do these ER exit sites fully look like? And what do these transport intermediates look like? Um, and so we felt that this is the perfect system for doing a FIBSIM uh, correlative analysis uh, through a whole cell to look at these structures. So this, is a, this work was done by Aubrey Weigel and Chilin Cheng. Um, Aubrey is now running the COSIM team, so she's a perfect person to be working on this. Uh, Chilin is a really talented postdoc in the lab. Um, and uh, basically, here's a cell where we fit in through the whole thing, the whole cell. Um, but before we did that, the cell had been expressing SEC23 so that with a GFP tag. So that prior to our FIBSIM, we can use structural elimination microscopy in a cryo state to look at where all of the ER exit sites are. And then we can superimpose that onto the FIBSIM image so we know where all the ER exit sites are. And so here's, um, that allows us to be able to reconstruct the ER exit site. And that's what you're seeing in this movie here. Um, in the blue is the endoplasmic reticulum and green is the ER exit site. And I hope you can appreciate that you really need to section significant distances to get a whole 3D perspective of this organelle. Now in red is the site where the ER exit site is connected to the ER. And it's usually a single, it's one or two necks that connect an elaborate tubular type of structure um, to the ER. And that structure interconnects with microtubules. So we've looked at hundreds of these ER exit sites in single cells. They have very similar shapes uh, on average, about 360 nanometer diameter. The tubules that comprise this intertwined system are about 40 to nanometer, 40 to 60 nanometers. Interestingly, if we pulse cargo into the secretory pathway using the rush system, we can see that these ER exit sites enlarge. Um, it's not that more of them are forming, or you see more vesicles coming out from different places. Single ER exit sites get enlarged. This is an eight minute post TNF alpha release uh, assay where um, we basically did a full FIBSIM reconstruction of cells eight minutes after releasing this rush cargo from the ER and then compared the structure of the ER exit sites to ones where the cell had not been, where the that were not transfected. What about the machinery that regulates these ER exit sites? Um, COP2 is the coat that's thought to sculpt and play an important role in forming uh, the structures of the ER exit sites. Um, we could definitely see it uh, at these, at these um, on these structures. In fact, it was our marker for these ER exit sites in the fifth sim data sets. But interestingly, if we also come in and look at this other code protein called COP1, we see that it's also at these ER exit sites, but it's more peripherally localized compared to the COP2, which seems to be, we think, more localized towards the neck. If we look to see which of these two code proteins actually moves with cargo as it moves out of these ER exit sites towards the, to the, uh, the, the Golgi apparatus, we see that it's only COP1, not COP2, that's traveling with cargo to the Golgi. 
So here's a COP2 uh, marker. Um, you can see these are all the different ER exit sites. Here's collagen 10 that we just released from the ER. It's moving into uh, the Golgi, and this is just a time-lapse series color coding the position of the collagen carriers at different times. And you can see that SEC23 does not move from these ER exit sites. And that's totally different from COP1, labeled with this Epsilon COP probe. Um, it's moving with the cargo um, out of these ER exit sites uh, towards the Golgi. So let's look at these, ER, these carriers. Um, this is an eight minute um, cryo correlative image where we're gonna look at the cargo eight minutes after it's left these, uh, the ER and is moving towards the Golgi apparatus. Um, this is a FIPSIM reconstruction of that cell. Each of these uh, rectangles represent uh, different uh, transport intermediates uh, that are carrying uh, the TNF alpha cargo. So here's the TNF alpha signal. Um, and you can see it's aligning with very interesting structures that have a pearling uh, shape associated with them. Here's the TNF alpha that you can see concentrated along the surface um, of this continuous pearled um, uh, tubule that on the one hand connects to the ER exit site and is also running along uh, the surface of a microtubule. Uh, this is just a sum up of this. Here's the 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 actual the EM. Uh, here's the rush cargo. Here's we're filling in the structure that this rush cargo is uh, associated with at the EM level, and you can see the alignment with the microtubules. And here's the ER exit site. Um, and here's where we've done the same thing, but now uh, we haven't introduced any cargo probe into the cell because one of the first questions that sort of arose in our mind was, this is a really amazing new structure. Um, maybe we're inducing it by expressing this cargo protein. Um, so can we find these structures in cells where we haven't overexpressed uh, any type of uh, cargo protein? And the answer is yes. So here's a, here are the ER exit sites that we can recognize pretty easily now because we know what they look like. Uh, Here's one of these pearling tubule shapes that emerge, emerging from those ER exit sites that are um, tethered uh, at one end uh, to microtubules consistent with um, the idea that they're being pulled out um, along a microtubule. So this is our model for ER exit site ultrastructural and its rela relationship to uh, transport intermediate. Um, COP2 we think is uh, serving as a gatekeeper for entry of cargo into this ER exit site. And COP1 is playing some important role in the way that these exit sites are either um, sort of transform transforming into these amazing tubule shapes or re uh, part of a regulatory machinery that allows these things to interact with microtubules. Um, this role of COP2 uh, as a coat on a continuous structure may be very surprising to some of you, but this is the model we think might explain it. Um, we know that COP2 is dynamic. It's recruited onto membranes through a SAR GTP release cycle. Um, we think that if membrane gets pushed through what would normally be just a little coated vesicle too quickly, instead of a vesicle, you may end up with a much larger protruding structure which we think is what we're seeing in these mammalian, in this mammalian system. Um, so what that would leave you is a COP2 at the neck. Um, and if the COP2 is still undergoing a SAR GTPase binding and release cycle, it would stabilize this neck to allow for um, a continuous sorting process into these ER exit sites. So with that, I wanna end by saying there's a lot of new biology out there um, to be discovered uh, with these new approaches that we have and more that are coming uh, for marrying dynamism with ultrastructure um, of cells. And um, I am uh, looking forward to chatting with you guys and uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, I also wanna give a shout out to 
uh, all the people who've done this work, um, Audrey, uh, Audrey Weigel, uh, really started off as a postdoc in my lab working on this your exit site business, but then quickly we realized this is a big thing. We need to do, she needed a sort of bigger world. And so she's been part, she's been drawn into this COSEM project team. Single particle tracking, I mentioned for Severo, Johnny Nix, Abel, uh, He Jing Choi uh, did all of the work that I talked about with the mRNA. And um, the, the Metin work was done by uh, Andy Moore. Um, I also want to thank uh, my colleagues, Harold Hess and his team. Uh, basically, they really made the FIPSIM uh, uh, experiments possible because of the way that they uh, fine tuned uh, that uh, system. Thank you so much. I will stop sharing and um, if there's any time for questions, um, we, can, we can go for it.